Thank you, Lisa. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you for your kind invitation. Thank you, Eric, for uh, setting everything up. Uh, what a tremendous facility this is. It's, it's very impressive, and I can only imagine what a great asset it is to your community and really to the world. Um, so uh, congratulations on that. Who knows where the first substantially complete dinosaur was found? New Jersey. <laughs> Haddonfield, New Jersey in 1858, so don't mess with New Jersey. Um, so you might think it odd that a guy who has spent uh, a year in that tent right there in Patagonia is giving a talk uh, about technology. Um, until recently, paleontology hasn't changed very much. Uh, we substantially do it the same way uh, now as it was done 150 years ago. And uh, I like the old ways. And, uh, and we're going to continue to do things the old ways, which is why I brought my shovel out here. So when you're doing field work, um, you're almost never comfortable. Uh, you're always either too hot or too cold or windblown or calloused or bruised or bleeding sometimes. Uh, but what I always tell my students is that in my view, am I blocking the picture here? In my view, comfort is way overrated. Um, I mean, think about it. We try harder and harder to make ourselves more and more comfortable, but does that correlate with happiness uh, in my life? All of the most profound moments, all the most sanguine experiences have all happened while I have been uncomfortable. <laughs> and uh, many of them have happened with uh, one of these in my hand, a shovel. And so sometimes uh, people will say, do you think we'll ever get to time travel? And I say, yeah, I have a time machine right here. <laughs> um, geology has laws, and the very first law of geology is Steno's law of superposition. And that simply says that the old stuff is on the bottom and the young stuff is on top. Now that seems like a pretty simple law, right? But that was not obvious 300 years ago. Um, so you can take this time machine here and dig into the ground and you are digging back in time. You're traveling back in time. You're going back to past landscapes. You're going back to a time where there are extinct organisms that people have not yet seen. You're going back to a time where humanity is irrelevant, where humanity does not exist. You're going back to a time when the earth is ruled by the laws of nature. And you can go back with a very simple tool and you can deal with that world. You can deal with nature with things that you can buy in the hardware store. How many of you know this guy? You ever watch the Woodwright shop? on PBS, Roy Underhill, great guy. So Roy does this amazing TED talk where he comes out on stage with a log and an ax, which is where I got the idea. Um, he comes out on stage with an ax and he talks about how he takes nature with that simple item and turns it into culture with nothing more than an ax. And I would say that you can take nature and turn it into science with nothing more than a shovel or a hammer, or a chisel, or a pickaxe. It doesn't take a lot more than that. And uh, I was very fortunate in that I learned the value of, uh, and, the, and the rewards of physical labor early in my life from my father, who was a carpenter and a jokester, as you can see. Um, and he really taught me how satisfying it is to work with your hands. Uh, one of my favorite authors is Michael Pollan who writes a lot about food. And one of his first books um, was about building a cabin, this cabin, in his backyard where, uh, where he could go and write, a place of his own. And uh, he didn't grow up uh, working with his hands, so it was a big struggle for him. But he wrote, I think, in the most beautiful way possible about the satisfaction of physical work. And what he wrote is that at the end of a hard day of labor, you stand back and you see what you've done and you have made an unassailable contribution to the stock of reality. Beautiful way to put that. 
And that's the same thing in paleontology. After a hard day of cutting your knuckles and, and digging at the ground, you stand back and you see something that no human has ever seen before. And it's this unassailable contribution to the stock of reality. Something is a little bit different in the world today than it was yesterday because you used the shovel to dig a hole in the ground. And all of my predecessors knew this. This is Roy Chapman Andrews, the real Indiana Jones, who led a series of uh, the Central Asiatic expeditions to Mongolia. Found a lot of dinosaurs, found protoceratops, uh, oviraptor. Here is a uh, nest of what he thought were protoceratops eggs. They turned out not to be protoceratops eggs. They turned out to be oviraptor eggs. And he gave this crazy looking dinosaur the name oviraptor. It means egg thief. He thought it was, he found bones nearby and he thought this predatory dinosaur was preying on these eggs. It turns out not to be the case. It turns out to be those are oviraptor's eggs. And many decades later, this amazing fossil was found by researchers at the American Museum. You're looking top down on a mother oviraptor who is brooding a nest of eggs. These are feathered dinosaurs. So she has her feathers covering the nest. And this mother was so devoted to her clutch that she allowed herself to be buried by a sandstorm uh, and then was later fossilized, as you see there. Another one of my uh, heroes in paleontology, Ernst Stromer here, you can see with his pickaxe and his uh, adult refreshment, which is common for both paleontologists and Germans. Um, he did a lot of work in the Baharia Oasis in the Sahara Desert of Egypt, uh, discovered some magnificent dinosaurs that no one had ever seen before, including this one, Spinosaurus. Spinosaurus is as long as a school bus. It's as big as a T-Rex. Um, lived in this mangrove swamp on the south coast of the Tethys Seaway 95 million years ago. Through a lot of effort, he excavated those bones. He brought them back to the Bavarian Museum of Natural History and mounted them on the wall, as you see here, really changing reality. And certainly, there are plenty of dinosaurs in the United States. And this is a, a very famous uh, locality, uh, Garden Park fossil locality in Colorado, where some of our most beloved dinosaurs have come from, Allosaurus, Brontosaurus, AKA Apatosaurus, um, uh, Stegosaurus, uh, and um, who am I missing? Diplodocus. And um, so this area has been worked by lots of paleontologists, including um, O.C. Marsh, who you see up top here. These are his students from Yale. I can't imagine what Drexel Risk Management would do if I <laughs> armed my students before I sent them out. <laughs> on the excavation, but you got to admit that's a pretty cool picture. And, uh, and these guys found Stegosaurus, and here's the first uh, reconstruction of Stegosaurus that Marsh worked with uh, uh, an artist to do. Again, this is, you can see, back to the early days of paleontology. There's this, there's this conversation between scientists and artists. And here's my crew in Patagonia. And we do things essentially the same way that our predecessors do. We do things the same way as the, the, the giants whose shoulders we stand on did. And so our life in the field is probably pretty comparable to O.C. Marshes and, and Ernst Stromer and Roy Chapman Andrews and, and everybody else who continues to do this work. And so we work in the same method and we find dinosaurs in the same method. And probably, this is sort of a preemptive strike, the, the most common question that I get asked when I give talks is, how do you find a dinosaur? Um, we all use the same formula, but it's a secret. <laughs> but I can tell you guys. Um, so organisms live for a certain number of years, right? a certain geological interval. So you have to find rocks of the right age, depending on what you're interested in. If you want to find trilobites, don't go to the Cretaceous. right? You need to go to the Paleozoic. If you want to find dinosaurs, you have to find rocks that are between the late Triassic and the end of the Cretaceous, unless you're interested in the dinosaurs that we call birds, which survive until today. So it's fairly easy to find rocks of the right age now because the Earth is geologically mapped. It didn't used to be the case. And so if you go back to the 18th century, we would have had no ability whatsoever to predict what strata might occur in a particular place. The, the discipline of stratigraphy had not yet been invented. And it wasn't until 1815 when William Smith 
published this first country scale geological map that really for the first time gives us predictive insight to say, oh, I think I can find Jurassic deposits there. Or, oh, I think I can find the Carboniferous over there. And so when we go to a field site now, we have the benefit of stratigraphy. We have the benefit of all those geological maps. So if you want to find trilobites, you go up there to the Paleozoic. And uh, if you want to find uh, dinosaurs from the late Cretaceous, like I do, uh, you go down there to the uh, deposits at the bottom. Of course, you can only find fossils in sedimentary rocks. You can't make a fossil in an igneous rock or in a metamorphic rock. And so the process of fossilization requires both sediment and water. And so you have to limit yourself to that rock type. And then today, it has to be a desert. Dinosaurs were cosmopolitan. They all lived on land, but they lived in every different environment you can imagine. If you watch the Discovery Channel or National Geographic, you'll see paleontologists usually working in deserts. It's not that dinosaurs lived in deserts. It's that deserts provide the exposure into that window of time. Deserts provide the the outcrop and the erosion to bring the fossils to the surface so that the dinosaur and the paleontologist can meet. So if you get yourself in that right situation, rocks of the right age, um, sedimentary rocks, and, um, and a desert, thank you, um, you will find dinosaurs every time. In fact, when you go down to that field area in Patagonia, you see all these pebbles on the ground? Every one of them is a piece of dinosaur bone. And so when you get yourself in that situation, it's not really a question of will you find fossils or not. You're going to find fossils. Then it's a question of do you find something that's scientifically significant or not. And that's you know, the, uh, the serendipity that's involved. So my field site in Patagonia is down near Tierra del Fuego, down near Fin del Mundo. And um, if you could fly there directly from Philadelphia, which you can, it's about a 10 airport trip, round trip. Um, but if you could fly there, when you cross the Amazon River, you're not yet halfway there. As you sit here tonight in Kansas City, you're closer to the Amazon than I am when I'm at my field site in South America. You have to go up to uh, Newfoundland to be as far away. So it's very remote in an area about the size of Connecticut. There are three houses. This is one of them. My friend Gaucho Ramon, beautiful. You see the, the Cordillera or the Andes there. Uh, we see these Andean condors every day. They have a nine foot wingspan. And they're scavengers, of course. So if you want to see a condor, you lay down in the desert and you pretend to be dead. <laughs> and about 20 minutes later, you'll see the condors start circling and you can take your pictures that way. So although we enjoy the condors, we go down there for the sauropods. Go for the condors, stay for the sauropods. Right? Um, and sauropod dinosaurs are the long neck, long tail, quadrupedal, uh, animals. There were some diminutive ones that got to be the size of an elephant, but uh, some of them got to be 60, maybe 70, maybe 80 tons. They um, are just uh, titanic creatures, and in fact this group of sauropods is called the titanosaurs. So 60 tons is the mass of a dozen full-grown bull African elephants. And so it kind of staggers the mind that this could be an individual animal, right? How could an animal like that possibly survive? How, what's their physiology like? How could they respire? How could they regulate their body temperature? How could they take in enough calories? How could they reproduce? They obviously did all those things. Um, but it's amazing that, uh, that they could. The first field season down there, uh, was a very tough one. We had no road to get into the site. We had to raft down a glacial stream to get there. We found some very big bones, and they were all what we call permineralized. They, they became mineralic copies uh, of iron minerals. So we found some of the biggest bones ever seen that had turned to iron. So I thought we were going to need a helicopter to get the fossils out of there. And actually, I met with the Argentinian Air Force, and they said, see, and the general said, see. And on the day it was supposed to happen, it turned out to be a presidential level sign off. And, the president was in Spain, and um, so with 10 days left in the expedition, I found out that there wasn't going to be a helicopter. So I had to come up with plan B. So plan B involved rafting supplies across the river, hiring a gaucho and a team of horses to take these supplies to the top of the mountain, jacketing the bones in plaster and burlap. I went into town four hours away and had a welder build a metal toboggan put the jackets on the metal toboggan, belay them around my hip down to that gully over there, clear out a two-mile path of basalt boulders, 
hitch them to another sled, tow the bones out to the desert to the point where we could get a front end loader in. And we only had a few days to get all this done. So here's taking the, uh, the supplies across this river. This river is really fast moving and it was ice yesterday, literally. It's very, very cold. Here's one of the horses taking a, a couple packs of plaster up for us. They weigh about 70 pounds each. And here is a jacketed dinosaur bone being hauled out of the desert by two gauchos there. And so uh, I've been down there with, uh, with this crew here and with this crew, and they get a little more kind of field hardened each time, and with this crew. And we find lots of bones. These are ribs that you see here. And the bones that we find are generally pretty big. Uh, here's a big bone here. And you can see we're wrapping it with a paper towel first, act as a separator, and then we start to cover it with bandages of plaster and burlap. For a big bone like this, we'll jacket some metal in there as well. This is a single vertebra in the neck of a dinosaur, uh, jacketed again. To save money, I've learned to drive the front end loader, which is probably the most fun a professor can have. Um, so this is my favorite part of the expedition. And uh, so we kind of get everything ready for a couple days of extraction with the front end loader at the end. There's that one I showed you coming out. There's uh, about eight bones in that jacket. Since I was in Kansas City, I thought I'd show you a bucket of ribs. <laughs> and then we uh, load everything into an ocean container out in the desert with a nice Argentinian customs agent following me around with a clipboard the entire time. Sometimes he brings the dog that wears the vest as well. Um, and then uh, I... I literally have a day when I can say my ship came in, and uh, this was the day. And so one of those containers has 16 tons of dinosaur bones in it. And then there's still a lot of hard manual work after that. There's preparing the fossils. So we have to open the jackets. We leave a lot of rock on the bones on purpose to protect them and stabilize them. So we have to remove that rock very carefully. We have certain chemicals that we use to stabilize the bones. There's stuff made for this, actually, commercially. There's paleo bond, which is a glue, and there's a putty called Jurassic gel, which, <laughs> which we buy a lot of. And so we stabilize the bones so that they'll last as long as possible in a future museum. And then, of course, the science begins, and we, we uh, measure the bones very carefully. We describe the anatomy in excruciating detail. We'll, we'll have a student doing a whole dissertation on a neck, another student doing a dissertation on a tail, and so forth. There's so much material. Um, and then, in some cases, what happens next is that a dinosaur will go to a museum to be mounted. And mounting very big dinosaurs like sauropods is a tough endeavor. And it's not necessarily great for the bones as well. So when you mount big dinosaur bones, you have to create this huge uh, steel or iron armature, and then you attach the bones to that. In some cases in the past, they have drilled holes through the bones so that they can run pipes through, or in some cases they put bolts in the bones or clamps and things like that. So none of that is really good for these ancient fossils. Um, and then once the bones are erected, uh, it looks nice, but it's kind of a problem for the scientists that come later, because if you want to do some work on that dinosaur, it's almost impossible to disarticulate that mountain then and to take an individual bone out. You have to do something like this, but uh, even if you can come in on a day when the museum's closed, and in some cases you need to get a cherry picker, um, some bones are touching others, they're articulated, and so you can't get to certain aspects of the bone when they're mounted like that. And so uh, the alternative to this has been to mold and cast fossils. And, uh, in traditional sorts of ways. And this is a little bit better, but it still has some problems. So uh, when you mold a fossil, and you could use um, different compounds uh, to do this, but you don't get perfect fidelity that way. And you'll see on display, some casts are very, very good. This picture is from a company that does very, very nice work. Uh, some casts are just terrible, and they don't really uh, portray the anatomy of these animals very well at all. Plus, the actual molding and casting can damage fossils. 
And once you make a mold, you only get so many pulls from that mold. You only get so many casts to come out of the mold before the mold degrades. And in the meanwhile, you have to curate the mold, which is even bigger than the dinosaur, right? And so it's, it's somewhat problematic. So that's the old way of doing paleontology, um, which I like. And we're going to keep doing the old way. But now I want to talk to you about some new ways of doing paleontology. And in the last 10 years, but especially in the last five years, there's been some amazing breakthroughs that have occurred. That scientists are using synchrotrons, very powerful radiation going through fossils to image embryos and the insides of bones and the insides of fossil feathers and such. Uh, Stefan Schuster out at uh, Penn State University a few years ago, he sequenced the entire genome of the woolly mammoth. The woolly mammoth genome was sequenced before the elephant was sequenced, which is pretty amazing. My friend Mary Schweitzer down at NC State in Raleigh, um, she has been recovering protein and blood vessels and blood cells and other tissues from uh, T-Rex, from a duckbill dinosaur. Um, this protein can still be sequenced, so you can see that if it's truly ancient protein, it should fall out between crocodiles and, and birds today, and it does. Um, Hans Larsen up at McGill University in uh, Quebec is tweaking the genes in chicken embryos, and chickens are dinosaurs, and he's making them grow their dinosaur tails again, which is pretty amazing. Um, and so there's a lot of really high-tech stuff going on in paleontology right now. And so with a shovel, you can turn nature into science, but then you can take it way beyond that with what's happening. So now we're going to add some modern tools in here, <laughs> like a 3D laser scanner here, which I have in my lab. And with a 3D laser scanner, you can take this hard one bone chipped out of the earth with, with uh, stuff you buy at the hardware store, and you can then scan it, capture the 3D morphology of it, and then turn that into a virtual object. And that virtual object then has the, the potential to do many things that the actual physical object uh, cannot do for you. And so when you um, capture the digital images of the bone, one of the things that you are doing is you're digitally curating that fossil. And so a digitally curated fossil, it doesn't degrade. It can be ported anywhere in the world effortlessly, right? Uh, it doesn't take up space, and um, it's wonderful. Let's go back to our friend Ernst Stromer von Reichenbach here from the Baharia Oasis in Egypt. So this was Stromer's life work, finding these dinosaurs in Baharia that he brought to the Bavarian Museum. And Spinosaurus is a very famous dinosaur. How many of you have heard of Spinosaurus before tonight? It's not as famous as I thought it was, but it's still pretty <laughs> famous. Um, how many of you saw the uh, Jurassic Park 3 10 years ago? All right, so if you remember the homicidal maniac dinosaur that was trying to kill off the entire cast, that was Spinosaurus, okay? Um, so Stromer found the Spinosaurus, brought it to the museum where it um, was on display for decades until these guys got involved in April of 1944. And so it turns out that uh, Hitler's Nazi party headquarters in Munich happened to be across the street from the museum, which really kind of shoots the neighborhood when Hitler <laughs> moves in. Um, and so in April of uh, 44, they, they bombed Munich. They took out the headquarters, but they took out the museum. And they took out the one Spinosaurus skeleton that the world has ever had. And um, the facades of both buildings um, remain standing, and they have built those since then. And I've gone back. Uh, to this place, and here you can see the, the standing facade of the uh, Museum of Natural History, and this is this building right here, and Hitler is walking out there, and I went in there, and now there is a uh, Starbucks there. <laughs> so take that, Hitler. <laughs> uh. But it's a sad story, because the, uh, the world lost this uh, wonderful, enigmatic, one-of-a-kind Dinosaur. Can, so can you imagine if Ernst Stromer had a 3D scanner in his lab? 
they could have scanned Spinosaurus, and even though the original was destroyed, we would still have a perfect copy of it, a perfect copy that could be replicated, that could be studied, that could be used for biomechanical analyses, and uh, what a tragedy that we have lost that specimen, but um, think of all the dinosaurs that will be preserved in the future now because we have this technology. So this is a way to uh, foster virtual collaboration. Last year, um, I wanted to uh, examine the snout of a dinosaur that was uh, found in Morocco, and it's probably another specimen of Spinosaurus. We're never going to know for sure because Stromer's type specimen of Spinosaurus didn't have a snout. So unless somebody finds another Spinosaurus that has overlapping parts, you can't really say for sure, but it's probably a Spinosaurus snout. And so, uh, not that I'm complaining, but I had to get on a plane and go to Milano um, to see the Spinosaurus. Now, with uh, virtual collaboration, you can map out, say, not only the, the gross morphology, but the, the muscle attachments very carefully and transfer those onto a virtual model. And then two paleontologists could collaborate, um, even if they're not on the same continent, much the way that physicians collaborate today across continents, across the country. Physicians today use virtual technology to, to bring healthcare to remote areas where there is no doctor or to get expertise from other places around the world where, where it may not exist in, in their own country. And so I think that we'll be able to take this kind of approach and apply it to paleontology. And, um, and we'll have paleontologists from other continents then working together on the same dinosaur virtually. And these virtual copies of dinosaurs uh, allow you to do experiments in ways that weren't possible before. I, a femur of a big sauropod dinosaur is taller than I am. And since it's been mineralized in part, it might weigh 1,100 pounds. Well, you're not really going to be able to do a lot of experiments with an object that weighs 1,100 pounds. But you can print out a copy of one. And so here's a, a copy of a humerus that we found in Egypt of a dinosaur called Peralotitan. And the original humerus would come up to about my ears. And so this is printed at one-tenth scale. And it's very, very accurate, preserves a lot of details. And we can now do experiments. And we can do experiments in two different ways. We can do them in the physical world. So we can do actualistic experiments by creating uh, robot dinosaurs. And the advantage of doing it in the real world is that even if you're not smart enough to include all the variables that you should include, or maybe you don't have the computational power to include all the variables that you should include in an actualistic model, in a real world model, they're in the model. Because this bone exists in the real world just like you and I do. And all the forces that are acting on us is acting on this bone. So it has what roboticists call agency, right? This thing really exists in the world. And you're really testing a real model when you do that. The other way of doing it is to do it in a virtual sense. And when you do that, um, you may not have all the variables, but you can do a lot of iterations. And one, one idea that really fascinates me is we can get to the point where we can use evolution to help us figure out evolution. And so if you, if you assemble a virtual skeleton of a dinosaur and you test it biomechanically for efficiency, you can make random changes to that skeleton run other iterations and see if it's more efficient or less efficient. The more efficient ones you keep, the less efficient ones you assassinate, and then you mutate the one that's more efficient. And you can do that thousands, millions of times. And you're using natural selection then to improve your model. You're using a genetic algorithm then, you're using evolution to figure out evolution. And so we can add a, a tool to our arsenal here, which is a 3D printer. And 3D printers come in many varieties. 10 years ago, this was you know, multi-million dollar technology. Now you can buy the MakerBot printer for about $1,500. And so they're, you know, people are literally getting them in their garages now. Um, and you can create these uh, replicas and turn them into robots and do experiments. The way these 3D printers work mostly, there are a couple different ways of doing it. But the most common way is um, a device that extrudes two different kinds of material, one that's for positive area, one that's for negative area. And then you can either dissolve or break away the negative area material, and you're left with a 3D object. And there are a couple different ways of doing that. 
So here we have um, uh, a limb of a, a dinosaur that we scanned in my lab and shrunk it down to one-tenth scale, printed it out, identified the muscle attachments on that limb, and then verified those muscle attachments because you can't generally just open a book and see the musculature of any given dinosaur. It's actually not published. So you have to, you have to kind of figure this out as you go. And so we verify those muscle attachments by dissecting birds and crocodiles like this and, and such to make sure that um, it uh, comports with our model. And then once we think we have that right, then our next step is we use a glue gun and we put rubber bands in the muscle insertion, uh, insertion spots just to see if the model's stable. If we have it wrong, it, it's, it's going to flop over or not hold itself up. And once we think that's pretty good, then the next thing we do is take off those rubber bands and insert uh, wires hooked up to servo motors controlled by a computer driven by a biomechanical algorithm that we write. And in that way, we get an actual working model that then can be used to test our biomechanical hypotheses. And so we have a little uh, imitation cartilaginous pad here, and we can measure the force that goes into that movement, and we can measure the force that's consumed by that movement, and then we can tweak the model to see if we can achieve a greater level of efficiency. The one thing that we can assume with these really big dinosaurs is they had to be hyper-efficient creatures. I would say that a sauropod dinosaur can do more with a calorie of food than any animal on the planet today, any animal on land, certainly. And so to get to be 60 tons, you have to have not only a lifelong obsession with eating, <laughs> but you have to really use your calories well. So I'm guessing that these guys didn't do anything that wasn't efficient. I imagine a sauropod day looks something like this. You stand on four feet, you have access to a huge feeding envelope because of your 30-foot neck. You clear out that envelope over the course of a couple hours, and then you go like this, and then you do it again. You're expending very little energy by doing that. They probably don't need to expend any energy regulating their body temperature because they're literally as big as a house. So uh, their main metabolic challenge is going to be shedding heat, not acquiring heat and they have very efficient mechanisms to shed heat. They're very pneumatic. In fact, a big sauropod is kind of similar to a hummingbird. They have very pneumatic skeletons, lots of air cavities, not just lungs, but an air bladder up here, an air bladder down here. They, have that, they probably have that avian one-way uh, method of breathing that's very efficient for gas exchange. And so they're really just these hyper-efficient animals. So again, when we make a model more efficient, we think it's parsimonious. Right, that we're getting closer to the truth as we make a more efficient model. And so another tool that we can add to our odd arsenal here is a, a CT scanner. And paleontologists have been using CT scanners for uh, probably 15 or 20 years. Um, and this allows us to peer inside of the bone then, which can be very useful when you're trying to do biomechanics. So here's a bone that we had. We took it down to uh, Drexel's Medical College, and we have to wait until 3 o'clock in the morning when nobody needs it, and they'll kind of send it through on the sly for us. And um, here you can see a model of the bone, and this hollow here, this wasn't really air in the bone, but it's, it's what we call spongiose tissue, so it's tissue that's kind of honeycombed. Um, so it's, it lightens up the bone, but it allows for, um, um, in some cases, air, and in some cases, uh, vessels to go through. And so by doing this, now we can correctly model the strength properties of this bone now that we, uh, rather than cutting it open, now that we know what it's like inside. And so this is on the virtual side now. This is the work of a colleague. But you can assemble these virtual models and then put them through their paces. They might not be as accurate as an actualistic one, right? Because they don't have agency. They don't exist in the real world. But you can do a heck of a lot of iterations, which is another useful way of doing it. Here's a, an extinct crocodile that we found in New Jersey um, called Hyposaurus rogeri. And um, we scanned this. And I have a student who's working on the brain case anatomy of this crocodile from this uh, CT scan. Another exciting um, use of this technology is is that it, you know, it's, these are all very visual technologies. So they really fall at the nexus between art and science. And we've had some very interesting collaborations with artists, paleontologists typically 
uh, work with artists. And um, so you can use this kind of data, these kind of data, for uh, virtual reconstructions, for museum displays, for educational tools. This is a, an 18 foot long crocodile that we excavated in New Jersey about, um, I guess about six years ago. And so the way we got into 3D scanning was from uh, an art student in our College of Media Art and Design, Evan Boucher. And the first thing we did was to scan the skeleton of Thoracosaurus neocesariensis. And um, once we had that 3D data, Evan went to work bringing it back to life. And so uh, he dissected crocodiles to learn their musculature. He videotaped crocodiles in zoos to learn how they moved. He went down to Costa Rica to videotape what would be similar to a paleo environment for Cretaceous New Jersey. And then his master's thesis was this short movie of a reconstruction of Thoracosaurus neocesariensis. And um, he won that year National Geographic's prize for digital paleo art, which isn't a student award, it's a professional award. He later took that DVD into his interview with DreamWorks Studios, and now he's an animator for DreamWorks today. So we're very <laughs> proud of him. Um, and so what you see here is the scan of Thoracosaurus. And then what he'll do, we almost never find a complete skeleton of anything. And so what he does next is he uh, models the bones that are missing to uh, put back together a complete skeleton. Uh, and then you'll see he begins to uh, teach it to move. He begins to add the musculature. What's really great about the way he did this is if, if you watch an animated cartoon or an animated movie, um, what you're seeing is they, they say they want the leg to go from here to here. So they basically pull the leg, right? And then it just translates there over a, a number of frames. That's not how he moved this rig. The way he moved this rig was to virtually actuate the muscles. The muscles themselves are pulling the bones, which then pulls the skin and the rest of the body. And so this crocodile is walking like a crocodile. It's not walking like a cartoon. And in doing that, the science and the art, the information is flowing both ways. We're learning from the art. The artist is learning from the scientist. A couple times he came to me and said, Dr. Lacovara, you know, I don't think that it can work exactly like you think it does because when I try it, this part keeps rubbing up against this part or this part slips out. And so the information flows both ways in this. And so now you can see he's putting the muscles on the crocodile here and then he'll put the skin on. One of the most common parts of this crocodile that we find are the bony plates on its back called scoots. They have a lot of those. And then he starts to teach it to swim. And teaching it to swim was quite a challenge. That was the part of the project that was the hardest for him. And finally, he developed this sine wave function to move the tail that seemed like it was very efficient, this. And it seemed to do a really good job. And I love this shot of that's, those are the bones that we actually found swimming. Now there's the muscles back on and the skin. And next, he'll put it in the paleo environment. So we know what the environment was like. 65 million years ago, the world was much warmer than today. Um, verdant, high levels of CO2, uh, sea levels much higher. So the coast of New Jersey is all the way up against where Philadelphia is today, if you know the geography there, basically the Delaware River is where the coastline is. Sea level was so high that the Gulf of Mexico had connected to the Arctic Ocean and we're underwater at this location in, in, in Missouri. This is an uh, intercontinental seaway, so if you dig down here in the Cretaceous, you're gonna find marine animals like mosasaurs and plesiosaurs and, and things like that. And so based on the sedimentology of our quarry in New Jersey, he was able to reconstruct uh, the ancient environment here and put it back in. And one of the more common fossils that we find there is this little fish called Encodus. And Encodus this big will have fangs that are this big. It's called the saber-tooth herring. <laughs> and um, so we put poor Encodus in here as a prey species. And um, there are still crocodiles closely related to Thoracosaurus alive today called the gavial crocodiles. And most of them are ambush predators. They have very low caloric requirements because they're they're cold-blooded, right? They don't need a lot of energy. And so they can sit in one spot for a long time, literally with their mouth open, waiting for something to swim in, right? 
and there's poor encodus. And so that's kind of the promise of the um, scientific artistic collaboration that's possible with this 3D technology, which I think is wonderful. And this is really a, a great way to uh, show people what's in the, the mind's eye of the scientist. It's much easier to see it this way. So this is going to be the next victim. This is a, uh, a 65 million year old turtle that we found in New Jersey. It's about a yard across. We have this scanned, and now I have another uh, art student who is going to begin to uh, recreate the skeleton, put the muscles back on, teach this thing to walk, and how to swim. All those bones we've recovered from Patagonia, we have all of them scanned. It took thousands of volunteer hours to do that, and so we're going to be robotizing part of that skeleton. Eventually, we'll be able to uh, cast it for uh, display. We could cast it for educational purposes at a smaller scale or for display at a at a one-to-one -one scale. So beyond art and science, this technology has the potential to really democratize uh, this little portion of science, to democratize paleontology. Not all areas of science are funded equally well, and not all countries have the same resources in terms of funding. And so if you can port a bone around the world, it kind of levels the playing field. And there are some amazing efforts going on in this regard. Just last week, the British Geological Survey announced that they're releasing 20,000 scanned type specimens of fossils that are in their collection. You can go online when you get home tonight and go to the British Geological Survey and download these 3D models. Anybody can now. And so you can have these amazing fossils that you would have had to have traveled to Britain to see. Uh, but now you can have them to look at, have them for education, have them for experimental purposes. The Smithsonian has gotten big into this. And here's a, a great site that they set up on human evolution. And it's the evidence for human evolution. So you don't have to take it from us scientists. Here's the fossils. You take them, you spin them around, you look at them. You can see the evidence for yourself. And that really is a way of um, democratizing the process, right, of, of encouraging citizen science. This summer, the American Museum of Natural History ran a, a digital fossil camp for high school students. How fun would that be, right? And so they got to scan and print and assemble dinosaurs uh, during their summer camp there. And so the, uh, the future of paleontology includes lots of tools. I'm not giving up my shovel, um, not, to, not to sound like Charlton Heston, right? But, um, <laughs> but I plan on using the shovel. But we can take the real and the physical and blend it with the virtual, um, I think, to really advance the field in the future. And I think the combination of these two things is the future of paleontology. Thank you. All right, we have time for a few questions. Raise your hand. I'll come by with a microphone. I'll go here and I'll come back, Dr. Sklar. Um, are there any tools that you can use for identifying the bones below the surface, things like uh, satellite imagery, um, things that we haven't talked about tonight but are uh, you know, advances in uh, technology? Um, that's or, is a, there, or do bones do not, or do they just not put off anything that uh, uh, satellites will pick up? That's a dream that paleontologists have had for a long time. And every year when I go to conferences, there are talks about remote sensing techniques to prospect for fossils, and everybody goes to the talks, and, and it turns out it didn't work, is, is what the talk is. But they still get a talk out of it. Um, so ground penetrating radar doesn't really work. Um, Bones are permineralized with minerals dissolved from the surrounding rock. So they end up essentially with the same specific gravity as the sediments that are surrounding them. So there's nothing for the radar to look at, to bounce off. Um, there are a couple of special circumstances where it's worked a little bit, but it, it, it's, 
Unfortunately, it hasn't become a very useful technique. One remote sensing technique that actually works in the West in the Morrison Formation, um, dinosaur bones in the Morrison Formation concentrate uranium. So you can prospect for them with a Geiger counter. Yeah. Going back to the shovel age from the 1800s and the 1900s, and these fabulous collections of large-scale dinosaurs and museums that are mounted, is anybody digitally archiving these so that if anything should happen to them, that they have them for future use in the study? It's just starting. So five years ago, almost no one had a laser scanner. Um, today, probably most museums have a laser scanner. And so the, uh, the Smithsonian is, is doing that. The, I think the LA Museum, the, certainly the American Museum, we're doing it. Every bone, every fossil that comes into my lab now, just as a matter of protocol, gets scanned. But they're not the and, Oh, I see. I haven't heard of that happening yet, but I think it would be wise uh, eventually. It's a pretty major endeavor. If you go to, say, the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh, you know, they just redid Dinosaur Hall, and they just remounted the Plodocus. It would cost a lot of money and be a big effort to um, disassemble that mount. But I imagine the next time they renovate their Dinosaur Hall, that will be done. Yeah. Mm. Yes, sir. Oh, oh, oh sorry. I'm, I'm used to it. I'm in my teaching mode. I'm used to. Yeah. Um, I was wondering. You said that the uh, the sauropod, uh, in order to process out all that heat, that it had a skeleton that was formed very similar to bird skeletons. Well, I know birds tend to have very very fragile skeletons because of the the hollowness. Um, how can something that has bones that are that hollow, I guess is the best word. Uh, get up to 60 tons? Yeah, it's a great question. So sauropods have uh, really tough solid bones where they need them. So their limb bones are, are solid, right? And they can bear a lot of weight with their limb bones. But if you go into their axial skeleton, their cervical vertebra, their neck vertebra, very, very pneumatic, more air than bone. And they have a, a structure that's very strong, sort of a honeycomb type structure, lots of lamina and struts that provide strength without using a lot of material. And then as you go into the dorsal vertebra, there's more pneumaticity. In some of them, you see the pneumatic cavities invading into the ribs, invading into the hip, even down into the tail a little bit. And they get more pneumatic as they age. So these pneumatic cavities, when they come into contact with the bone, they remodel the bone and they actually invade into the bone. And so as the dinosaur uh, becomes larger in mass, it increases its capacity to shed air to the environment through the pneumaticity in its skeleton. It's a great question. I thought I saw the Towers of Pain in the background in some of your Patagonia shots. Uh, were you near there? And if so, how do you deal with the weather? Because it's really bad. I didn't catch the name of the town. Towers of Pain, the uh, large towers, and uh, they're very, very hard to climb. So you're not oh, near, in, in Patagonia. Tori Hager, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, we're near uh, uh, Cerro Torre and, uh, and Fitzroy. We don't climb those. We look at them. Yeah. They're, um, so we're, we're on the plains of Patagonia. It's high plains, pretty analogous to what the um, high line of Montana would be like or maybe the badlands of, of South Dakota. Um, but we're right up the Cordilleran range of the Andes, right up to it. But it's, um, it's not like our Appalachian Mountains where you kind of roll up into them. It's sort of like this. And so although we have this beautiful mountain view, we don't have to deal with mountain topography there. Does that answer your question? Well, I was asking about the weather. Oh, the weather. It's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> it's just awful. Yeah. Um, it, so we're down there in the austral summer. And uh, sometimes it snows on us. Uh, it's frequently cold. You'll see pictures of us working down there in the Patagonian summer in parkas. Um, not many t-shirt days down there. We see these weather systems pop up over the Andes, and we know we're going to get nailed in a half hour and we batten down the hatches. Some of them go around the world and hit us again because it's the only spot of land down there. When we get a wind from the south, we're, we know we're getting a storm coming up from Antarctica. And so the weather is just uh, horrible. Moimala. Yeah. Back here. 
Um, how can I find your presentation on Netflix? What's the name of it? Um, I think it's called uh, Biggest Dino Killer Colon Spinosaurus. I, I didn't name it, but. Uh, <laughs> but it's under your name. Yeah, I think it's called Biggest Dino Killer. And it's about Spinosaurus, which actually I think probably behaved like a 45 foot long great blue heron. Um, I think it was a, a fishing dinosaur and probably not the uh, maniac that they portrayed it to be. Yeah. I said that a lot on camera, but a lot of that got edited out. <laughs> yeah. The other question, mine was uh, about the uh, structure of the bones based on how big uh, sauropods were. Mm -hmm. Is Were they at the limit of how big an animal can be, or would it have been possible to be even bigger? That's a great question. Um, the dinosaurs that we're working on uh, don't show what we would typically see osteologically as signs of senescence. So we don't know if this group of animals had, um, if the biggest ones had determinate growth or indeterminate growth. and um, Nobody has really found, uh, of, the, of the few very, very massive ones, um, nobody has found evidence that they have hit senescence and stopped growing it uh, before the time of their death. So I don't think we know yet what the maximum size is. There's, there's a couple things. There's preservational bias, right? It's very, very hard to get a big dinosaur uh, fossilized. It's easy. For a little dinosaur, it dies, it gets covered with dirt, and it may turn into a fossil. But when you're as big as a house, when you fall over on a floodplain, say, very little of your body is in contact with the earth. And so there's a lot of time for weathering, there's a lot of time for scavenging to pull that skeleton apart. And so the fossil record for the biggest of the big is not very good. So that's one bias. And the other bias is a professional bias, which a lot of paleontologists will literally step over a big sauropod to get to a little dinosaur because it takes 10 years to dig up a big dinosaur and you have to be a little bit crazy to do it. Dr. Lacavera back here at the, in the last row. Um, what was the strangest dinosaur you've ever found? Hmm. Well, I know the strangest one I never found, which was Spinosaurus. I, I tried for two winters with uh, friends and colleagues of mine to recover a Spinosaurus, and we didn't find one, but we found a, a new type of dinosaur. Um, most of my work has been with the sauropod dinosaurs, and they're not, um, they're not the dinosaurs that you think of as the bizarre ones, right? So they don't have the crazy feathers or big claws or uh, strange things like that. So. Um, they're unique in that they're so large, but they're not especially strange. Yeah. All right, due to the time, we have time for one more question. I, yeah, I saw a hand up here earlier. Are uh, dinosaur bones subject to national laws of antiquities? Absolutely. So the United States is one of the few countries in the world that's, that does not have laws that governs our fossil patrimony. So you could go out here on private land tomorrow and dig up the most significant fossil ever found, put it on eBay, and ship it out of the country the next day, and it would all be perfectly legal. In most countries, that's regulated. In Argentina, when you put your hand on a fossil in the field, it becomes property of the government of Argentina at that moment. Whether it's on private land or public land, it doesn't matter, as it should be, I think. Um, so wherever I go in the world, I have to work closely with uh, the capital, the provincial geologists or provincial museum, and we of course do all this under permitting, but it's, that's one of the more complex parts of my job, the part that I don't usually talk about because it's mundane and bureaucratic, but um, the permitting for this kind of thing and, and the shipping insurance and just all that stuff is pretty uh, daunting. Thank you, Dr. Lacavera. Thank you very much, I enjoyed it. And thank you for attending tonight's lecture. Remember, two more, two days left for Crayon and Stone. Come here tomorrow or Saturday. And October 10th, 
6 p.m. is the opening of our next exhibition on the science of color. Thank you and good night.